The Orcs of Galarian are ferocious fighters, and while not typically tactical masters, they are known Galarian-wide for a reason. In today's breakdown, we're going to talk less on the lore of the Orcs, and more on how to roleplay Orcs during combat. This is a first in what I hope is a very well-received video series, so please, head into that comment section and let me know how I did on this first video. This video is one that I expect will have the most discussion, because it is ultimately an opinion piece. With that said, I'm asking everyone to please stay civil in the comments, because I would like to hear your thoughts on if I've described how an orc would fight, but I do recognize that opinion pieces can tend to get a little heated. Now. I am not the best at roleplaying, so that is a large part of why I've started this series. I want to improve my own roleplaying skills, so I picked up a few books and have been watching a ton of videos on GMing tips, from the Critical Role tip videos to the channel How to Be a Great Dungeon Master, and many other resources. This video is not the end all, you have to play it the way I say. This is simply one of probably hundreds of opinions on how each monster would play, looking at the lore and their stats from the second edition. I will describe how the orcs may attack and act in the first part of this video, and I'll back it up with the math that led me to these conclusions at the end of the video. If a creature is living, its most important goal, except in very rare cases, will be to survive. At the end of the day, all any living creature is truly concerned about is living another day. They may start fights they don't wish to under threat of death, but once the fight gets too close, they will inevitably flee if they are intelligent enough to see the writing on the wall. These next two sections will be displayed on screen, just so you can kind of get a visual of what I'm saying. An intelligence modifier of negative 5 is reserved for constructs or some undead types. An intelligence mod of negative 4 are animal-like intelligences who rely mostly on their instincts to get them through their day. An intelligence modifier of negative 3 to negative 1 are able to employ the most basic of tactics and understand when a certain action isn't working. An intelligence mod of zero is for your base humans, so they can come up with simple to use plans, they can use skills, all the things a normal human is able to do. While an intelligence modifier of plus one or higher can plan ahead, coordinate with others, and the higher that modifier, the better thought out their plans become. A wisdom modifier of negative five are typically animated objects and have little if any awareness. A wisdom mod of negative 4 to negative 3 are a bit more aware, but tend not to pay attention to their surroundings very well. A wisdom mod of negative 2 to negative 1 seem to lack common sense, like the majority of retail customers I've met, and rarely fail to consider all the options available to them. A wisdom modifier of 0 are your base humans and are capable of reasonable decisions. Wisdom mod of plus one to plus two can sense when a person is upset and can even get hunches on when something around them doesn't quite feel right. A wisdom mod of plus three or higher are able to read their surroundings better and better the higher that that modifier goes. A high dexterity and the enemies will be quick and speedy enemies, while a high strength will be hard hitting enemies. High strength and high dexterity and you have your predator types who hit hard and fast attempting to end fights in an instant. Low dex, low strength, you have your planners, who will only fight if they have the advantage. High constitution and low dexterity or low strength, you have the tanks who just take on the damage, usually paired with other NPCs of different stat types. Of course, this is all a gross oversimplification to try to align hundreds of enemy types, but it gets my gist across. This is all debatable and will more than likely be refined the further into my videos I go but this is how I tend to play enemies, with rare exceptions. With that said, we do need to cover a few lore facts about the orcs to understand how they would function within Galarian. All orcs were originally fearsome savages from the Darklands. Originally little more than animals, it was the war against the dwarves that drove them to rapidly evolve and learn the importance of armor and weaponry. Eventually, they found their way to the surface, with the dwarves chasing behind them during the Age of Darkness, where they quickly spread and ransacked everything they could get their meaty hands on. 
The Matanji orcs who crossed the sea to the south and discovered the Mwangi Expanse have a different history and won't be covered in this video. Eventually, the perpetual darkness gave way and light began to returning to Galarian. The orcs, who had previously lived in the dim darkness of the Darklands, were at a vast disadvantage and the sun they were completely alien to, and they became, began a steep decline that only ceased when the legendary orc warlord Belkzin was born. The orcs formed into a massive warband and sacked various dwarven skyholds, eventually claiming the land there and renaming it to the Hold of Belkzin, which they still hold to this day. The orcs remain extremely aggressive and can be found all across Galarian just begging for a fight. So we have a race originally from the Darklands who made their way to the surface, ran wild for over a thousand years and have claimed a country all their own. That sets a good base for their behavior, but let's move to their stats and see how that reinforces how they'd act. The Orc Brute make up the bulk of an Orcish warband, but are hardly considered a threat by themselves and less in numbers due to their ferocious and undisciplined nature. Now let's break down the stats and how I plan to rank them. The core rulebook on page 20 says that 10 is a human average, so we will base most of our decisions off of that average. An Orcish Brute is a level 0 enemy and starts with a plus 3 to strength, plus 2 to dex, plus 3 to constitution, and negative 1 to intelligence, plus 1 to wisdom, and 0 to charisma. I use the mental stats, being intelligence and wisdom, to decide how the creatures would act for the most part. As recommended in the book, The Monsters Know What They're Doing, by Keith Amon. It's a very good book if you have the time to read it. From this stat array, we can see that Orc Brutes are hardy, strong enemies with lower than average intelligence, no social skills to speak of, and a meager plus one to perception via their wisdom. They possess a plus five to athletics, showing how well their bodies have been conditioned for strength, and a plus two to intimidation showing they do at least have a chance of social interactions. They possess a plus five to perception, and dark vision means that they are just as much a threat in the dark as they are during the day. With a health of 15 and a matching AC, they're a decent threat for a group of low-level players. A four-player group of first-level players will have a slightly above moderate challenge from three orc brutes and an outright lethal challenge from five orc brutes. So, we now understand their base stats, but how would that affect how they approach combat? An orc has a speed of 25 feet and gains 3 actions per turn like any other creature. If the players are spotted by the orcs at a great distance, say 60 feet, the orcs would draw their weapons and charge the party. At the 30 foot range, they may stop to exchange angry words with the party, depending on the location. Are the orcs within their own territory, or are they in the process of raiding outside of their own lands? If within their own territory, they would most likely launch an attack without opening a dialogue with the players, but if they're out of their lands, they may be just hesitant enough to throw a few threats at the player as they size them up. With an intelligence modifier of negative one, they rarely plan ahead and most likely aren't analyzing the makeup of the character's armors or weapons, merely judging the group solely on size and how threatening they appear. The party may take this moment before the storm to attempt to parlay with the orcs, but I would say intimidation is the only social skill that would make a difference here. Diplomacy would almost be useless, because orcs are simply too aggressive to be called by offerings or promises. A high deception check to convince the orcs that they're more threatening than they appear may work, as well as a moderately high intimidate check which may convince the orcs they simply aren't worth the trouble. However, ending a fight before it begins may cause more trouble down the road, because an orc is simply not going to turn tail. They will return to their tribe angry and humiliated, and they will return in even greater numbers as a much tougher threat. As soon as talks get boring, the orcs would attack, either by attempting to launch javelins as a ranged attack, after which they would rush into combat eagerly, or just rushing. 
As they move into combat, they may attempt to demoralize, dropping the enemy's AC by 1 to 2 points depending on the levels of success they get. Once in close combat, the brutes would attack with knuckle daggers, with some attempting to disarm their opponents with the dagger's disarming trait. They are dumb, but even an orc is able to understand that getting a weapon out of an opponent's hand is typically a good idea. Flanking and tripping would make the enemy even easier to hit, which could easily become battle changing. Even with their battle prowess, if an orc is able to be downed, they can use the ferocity reaction, allowing themselves to stay at one health instead of dropping to zero. They can typically do this three times per combat encounter before losing access to this. Unless a party is able to concentrate fire and double tap an orc, they'll be back up the next round to continue the fight. So overall, you have an upfront skirmisher who excels in melee combat and rarely relies on ranged combat or diplomacy. They are physically gifted and imposing enemies, rarely traveling alone and a large threat to low level players. On top of all that, even if you manage to down them, if you fail to focus your fire on them, they'll simply get back up and keep swinging. However, despite most creatures focusing on survival, the unique culture of the orcs, plus their lower than average intelligence, leads them to be more willing to fight to the death. Dishonor from retreating can be just as deadly to an orc as losing in battle. However, if they do retreat, the orcs will not simply leave the players alone after a failed battle. They will lurk around, perhaps gathering reinforcements or waiting for some other obstacle to weaken the player before making their second attack. If they see the player struggling after a battle, they will rush in quickly, attempting to make up for their failure. However, this shouldn't come as a huge surprise. Orcs are not very stealthy creatures, and there should be evidence of their presence. Perhaps the players stumble upon their footprints, or if they've spent the night in an open area, they find a nearby campsite that had been recently occupied. Or perhaps they're even bolder than that, and the orcs simply watch them from a nearby hilltop, staying within eyesight, but well out of range of any attack. I'll be including some averages I've come up with by averaging the various stats of the level 1 pre-generated characters. I'm aware that this isn't the ideal way to come up with these numbers, and I hope to get a survey going to get me numbers for higher levels, but it gives me a good starting point. From the various iconic characters, you can see that the average of their ACs is rounded up to be 17. This means, with an orc's knuckle dagger that grants a plus 7 to hit, the orcs have a 55% chance to hit on the first attack of every turn. If they are able to get off a demoralize, that increases the chance to 60 or 65% with a critical success. If the orcs go all out and spends all three turns attacking, they possess a 55%, 35%, and a 15% chance to hit. But if your orcs use their plus 5 to athletics to attempt to trip their opponent, they have a 45% chance to trip. If successful, their chances to hit go from 55 and 35% to 65 and 45%, with the negative 2 to AC from being prone and flat footed. Alternatively, flanking the enemy also grants them a plus 10% to attack. So, if you demoralize and flank your opponent, that 55% chance increases to 70 to 75%. However, this is when your choices affect combat. Are the orcs smart enough to understand that flanking and tripping is a good idea, or should they only use these tactics when guided by a smarter leader? Per turn, that means an orc has the potential to do between 4 and 9 damage per attack landed. Even with the odds being very slim, a single orc is completely able to kill an average level 1 player in a single turn, able to pump out a total of 27 damage against the average level 1 health of 17. Of course, this would take some incredibly lucky rolls, but it is a very slim possibility. Add Ferocity into the mix, which can keep an orc alive for a maximum of 9 extra attacks if they aren't focused fire on and put down permanently, and you can see how the orcs have come off as such an intense threat in Galarian. The next monster breakdown will be on the orc warrior, a more dangerous and capable version of the orc brute. If you enjoyed this breakdown, let me know and I'll keep rolling them out. I'm separating each orc into its own video to keep searching between the different variants easier for the viewers.